Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, this is Rick Trainer, Rector of Exeter College, welcoming you all, alumni, fellows, students, staff, and friends of Exeter College, Oxford, to this Exeter College webinar. Indeed, arguably the first ever Exeter College webinar for all our alumni and friends. Now these days, online communication is very important to Exeter College, as to so many institutions in the conditions of the pandemic. And you'll have an opportunity um, to pose questions to our speaker uh, using the toolbar, which should be toward the center bottom of your screen. Second uh, box in from the right is a Q&A function, and you can type a question in there, and we'll be typing, taking some questions later on. But leaving aside the timeliness of the medium that we're using today, it's a particular pleasure to host this speaker on this subject. Our speaker is Sir Ronald Cohen, who is one of our own having read PPE at Exeter starting in 1964. He was an illustrious undergraduate, president of the union, but he's become even more illustrious in the meantime, as reflected in his knighthood and in his honorary fellowship of the college. He's the longtime head of the venture capital and private equity firm Apex Partners. He's played a leading role in a series of international task forces on social capital and social impact investment. And he's a major philanthropist and social capital investor himself. And he's the author of a book which will be published on Thursday, which I'm pleased to display for you at this very moment, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. And those are the themes about which Ronnie Cohen will be speaking to us today. And his formal subject is the Impact Revolution. Ronnie, it's a great pleasure to turn over the platform, this virtual platform, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, and uh, fellow Exonians and the friends of Exeter. Uh, this is a wonderful occasion for me. Uh, 53 years after I came down, I seem to be back in a tutorial with you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the other way around, Ronnie. <laughs> so, this time. Um, and I suppose I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for Exeter College. Uh, I owe a huge debt uh, to the college uh, for my education uh, and a, a second debt because I happened to be there in the 60s, uh, which was an unusual period uh, marked by idealism uh, and, uh, and, and fears. Uh, the fear of uh, nuclear conflagration, uh, among uh, others, and, and various uh, social fears too. And I suppose, Rick, rather than addressing the subject directly from the beginning, I'd like to just say a few words about my journey since I left uh, Exeter College. So I, I will remember after my term uh, uh, as president of uh, the union, which was Hillary 67, going home uh, at vacation uh, and saying to my dad, what am I going to do? I have a degree in PPE. Uh, I really don't know what I want to do with my life. And he said to me, well, why don't you go to Harvard Business School? And which was quite surprising. I'd never discussed that with my dad. But in those days, particularly after the presidency of the union, I sort of anticipated a political career. And in fact, I did stand for election to parliament a couple of times for fun um, in my late 20s and, and early 30s. But my goal was to become financially independent because my parents needed help. I came over here uh, as a refugee and my parents lost everything in, in Egypt. Uh, I arrived at the age of 11. My father had to remake his life um, at uh, the age of uh, 42. And um, 
And I had, therefore, to make myself financially independent. Um, and so the idea of going to Harvard Business School, which would prepare me for a career in business or in government, appealed to me. And then while I was at Harvard, where I felt I was in a trade school, I felt I had really learned to think at Oxford. Uh, and at Harvard, I found it less um, uh, inspiring from an intellectual point of view. But I must say, with the years, I wouldn't be sitting here uh, either if I hadn't gone to, um, to Harvard Business School. In any event, I smelt that something different was in the air. And I got, uh, luckily, a Henry Fellowship. I couldn't afford to go to uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, I got a Henry Fellowship, uh, which entitled me uh, to the first year's um, uh, tuition. Um, and um, had with it an obligation, which was to bring back to Britain uh, something of value. And when I was there, and this relates to the subject of this uh, talk, uh, the impact revolution, when I was there, I felt a revolution was in the air. The revolution was the tech revolution. Up until then, everyone had assumed that only big companies could deliver uh, technological innovation. Uh, the notion that uh, young, uh, even dropouts from university, uh, with the ambition to change the world, would actually be able to influence their sectors, um, for most people, was uh, just uh, an illusion. Uh, in Britain, few people could uh, spell the word entrepreneur or venture capitalist. In fact, the son of uh, one of my friends in the industry uh, went to an interview uh, at a school with his dad. Um, and, um, and the headmaster of the school asked him, Laddie, uh, tell me what uh, your dad does. He says, oh, he's an adventure copulist. So, so venture capitalist wasn't uh, a phrase that people knew uh, how to uh, spell either. But it turned out to be a historic change in the trend. Uh, technology uh, changed. Uh, our lives. Uh, and today, many of you on uh, this uh, webinar have not known the world uh, without uh, technology, but there was one. And in the process of bringing technology to our lives, we've seen companies that are only 20 or 25 or 30 years old overtake the biggest companies in the world at that time. Uh, the Microsofts and the, the Apples and the Amazons and the Googles and the Facebooks have all overtaken IBM. And so my career as a venture capitalist started because I sensed that something new was, was happening because I could make a social contribution uh, when I started off at the age of 26, what became Apex Partners with my co-founders. There were three million unemployed in the UK. And I saw myself fulfilling a social purpose as well as making money. And I realized as the years went on and I was lucky enough to become successful as a venture capitalist, that far from reducing the inequalities in the world, uh, I was helping to increase them. Uh, sure, I was backing um, entrepreneurs uh, who came from nothing, you know, for the most part, um, and that they were helping others enrich themselves. But the gap between rich and poor just kept getting bigger and bigger. And so, as I led Apex, I had, I had this sense uh, that uh, I would leave the firm when I got to the age of 60 uh, and uh, deal with social issues and with another issue that is very close to my heart, which is peace in the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians. Because 
being Jewish, having been born in, in uh, Egypt, uh, having an Israeli wife, I felt I straddled these different cultures um, and uh, could empathize uh, with both sides of uh, this conflict and make a contribution to it. And so at the age of, uh, of uh, 53 in 98, I said to my partners, I will leave seven years from now. I will leave the firm to you. We will create a succession. Um, and I will go off to try to deal with these issues that uh, I consider to be a lot more important than just making money. I didn't want my epitaph. I said to them to read, he made 30% annual return on the money he invested. And then in 2000, two years after I'd made that decision, I got a phone call from the Treasury and the call went something like this. It was the uh, Treasury under Gordon Brown in the Blair government and uh, the person who called me, Philip Rutnam, who's recently been in, in, in the news, um, uh, said to me, we've looked at poverty and we've made huge efforts to reduce it and all the social issues that stem from it. But we haven't really made the headway we anticipated. Would you have a look with a more entrepreneurial eye um, at this issue and make recommendations to us? And of course, for the reasons I've explained, I immediately said yes. And that was the beginning of the Social Investment Task Force and also the path that uh, brings me here today to talk about impact. As I sat around the table with half a dozen uh, people that I recruited to uh, this effort from different walks of life and looked at how our society deals with poverty and uh, the issues uh, that uh, flow from it. I realized that uh, philanthropists had uh, really started to tackle these issues uh, even before governments did. And then governments had uh, started to get involved. Um, philanthropists had uh, got uh, uh, foundations which enjoyed the tax uh, advantages. Um, such as those that uh, uh, the charitable foundation uh, that um, uh, holds the college's uh, endowment uh, uh, is. Um, and foundations had made a big effort in the early 20th century to help tackle social issues. And governments really got involved in the 30s in a serious way because they realized that uh, philanthropists couldn't do it alone. Of course, after the war, the Second World War, we had welfare states and, and, uh, uh, and uh, we began to provide a safety net uh, for uh, the poorest. But if you looked at the charitable sector, philanthropy had really caused quite a lot of harm in a way. Philanthropists had given them away money uh, with perfectly good intentions. Uh, and of course, it had led to good, undoubtedly. But if you looked at the charitable sector, if you looked at charitable service providers who were helping the homeless or uh, the school dropouts or the uh, prisoners um, uh, in jail, um, these organizations had invariably two characteristics. They were small and they had no money. And the reason was that when you give money away as a philanthropist to a, a delivery organization and don't measure anything very much, after a couple of years, two or three years usually, uh, you say, I'm sorry, but there are many other demands on my resources and I now have to help somebody else. And so we published a report in 2000, which said there must be a way to do what we did with venture capital for those who want to make money. And to do that, 
for people who want to improve the lives of others. It should be possible to bring investment to organizations that have a charitable purpose. And we recommended then that um, we should establish in the UK a social investment bank that brought people from the social sector and from finance and could innovate. And it's what happened in uh, 2005. The government announced that it was going to take dormant bank accounts away from banks. These are the bank accounts of people who've disappeared and can't be reunited with their money. And the people from the social sector came to me and said, uh, shouldn't we use this money to set up the social investment bank you recommended? And I said, absolutely, we should. And so I led a commission, the Commission on Unclaimed Assets, and it recommended that these dormant bank accounts, which at the time were estimated to amount to 400 million pounds, be used to help charitable organizations scale up and innovate uh, in the way that um, uh, they brought the capital to them to bring it by way of investment. And it's what happened uh, in 2007 to prove this proposition. I created with partners uh, Social Finance UK to invent uh, this way of bringing investment to charitable organizations in order to persuade the government to release uh, the 400 million pounds uh, to this new social investment bank, which eventually the David Cameron government did. One day in 2010, two 30 year old um, members of the team, the team was was young, came to my office and said, what do you think if in dealing with prisoners who go back to jail within 18 months of release, typically, if we defined a security, a financial way of investing that tied the return to the investor to the decrease in the number of people who went back to jail. I said, wow, you have found the key to investment for charitable organizations. If investors could put money in a charitable organization and reduce the number of uh, prisoners who go back to jail and the government agrees to pay the investors back with a yield, with a return, according to the success, then it's a way for charitable organizations to attract investment capital. And the Peterborough bond was the first social impact bond in the world, five million pounds. It lasted five years. It reduced the rate of recidivism by 9.7% and the investors got their five million pounds back. They were all charitable foundations, incidentally, um, but they got their five million back and made 3.1% a year. The reason I'm explaining all this is that for the first time, we had devised a security, a way of investing, which balanced not just risk and return, which is what investors typically have done for 250 years, but risk return and impact. And when David Cameron asked me to chair the G8 task force in 2013, he asked me to do so to spread social impact investment. In order to cover all the G8 countries, I created in each country a group of people like the Social Investment Task Force from different walks of life, from business, from finance, from philanthropy, from social delivery organizations, from academia. And we set about looking at the same 
situation, if you like, that I described for the Social Investment Task Force across the G8 countries. And something remarkable emerged from that. What emerged from that was that the world was changing. It was changing because young people were refusing to purchase the products of companies whose values they didn't share. They were refusing to work for these companies. Investors were already beginning to say, we can't chase after profit only. We have to have environmental, social and governance improvement as well. And in those days, 2013, seven years ago, $40 trillion had signed up to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, which basically said, take into consideration the environment and society when you make investment decisions. Today, that figure is two and a half times bigger. It's $100 trillion. And so, after we reported uh, in a, I think in a seminal report entitled The Invisible Heart of Markets. You can see the reference to Adam Smith's Invisible Hand of Markets in the Wealth of Nations. The Invisible Heart of Market is Impact, uh, which Adam Smith had covered in other terms when he wrote his first book, of which he was prouder than The Wealth of Nations, and it appears first. Uh, on his epitaph, the theory of moral sentiments, where he explored how human beings act out of altruism and empathy. So the Cameron government then asked me to continue to push uh, this effort uh, across uh, the world, not just the G8 countries. and. I've been, I embarked then uh, on, as this was started in the middle of uh, 2015, for five years on spreading these ideas and spreading innovation in implementing these approaches. And today it has developed into a revolution. Uh, the impact revolution is very similar to the tech revolution. Uh, it's driven by young people, and just as the tech revolution did, it will create the water on every ship sails. Uh, no business today can operate without, te without technology, and no business in the future, in my view, will be able to operate without impact. And let me uh, explain why I say this. If you look at our economic system today, it is the cause of our problems. Uh, we see a rejection of capitalism and democracy in some quarters today. But the reason is really our economic system. What is happening is that our economic system is not distributing social and economic outcomes fairly. And when governments don't redress the balance, people rebel against it, whether it be in France or in Chile or in the Lebanon or recently in the United States or even in Britain with the result of the 2016 uh, Brexit um, referendum. Our economic system in its search for profit is self-defeating. We could cope with this aspect of it, when the consequences were relatively manageable. Today, governments can't cope with the environmental consequences or even with the social consequences of the system. And so we have to ask ourselves, how can we get our system to redistribute outcomes more fairly? And the answer is a very simple one. It is, let's do what we did in 1929 when we were at a similar historic crossroad, when 
companies sat up and said, investors, forgive me, sat up and said, companies cannot just go and report on their profits, picking their own accounting policies and with no one verifying their numbers. We have to get companies to measure their profit properly. And that was the beginning uh, of what we call today generally accepted accounting principles. The US led in it, passed legislation in 33 when Roosevelt uh, was in power. Uh, and that legislation basically led to a very detailed set of rules now for measuring the profit of companies and having those figures verified by independent auditors. Today, investors who are putting $30 trillion into environmental, social and governance investment and another nearly trillion into impact investment, $715 billion into impact investment, which like ESG, as it's called, has the intention to create impact, but differently than ESG, measures the impact created. Those investors have no transparency on what impact companies are creating. And so we sit up today and we ask ourselves the question, are we really investing in companies and measuring only the profit they make without measuring the damage that they're causing to society and the environment? We need generally accepted impact principles. These numbers need to be audited. And the amazing thing that's happened in the 53 years since I left uh, Exeter College is that technology today enables us to do this. In fact, on this very day, an effort that I chair at Harvard Business School called the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative has published the environmental cost created by 2,500 companies. You can look at a company like ExxonMobil, and I'm not in favor of investing in fossil fuels, I'm against it, but it's instructive to note that it causes $38 billion worth of environmental damage in one year from its operations alone, without the destruction or the pollution that comes from using the oil it takes out of the ground. And if you compare that with its competitors, Shell is creating about $22 billion of damage a year. And BP is creating about $13 billion a year. Now, are these not figures that every one of us should be aware of, and especially investors? And if we look at the social side of things, if we look at the problems that come from lack of diversity and social and economic inequality that leads to the rioting that we recently saw in the United States after these terrible murders, you can take the payments made to employees by a company like Intel, which is one of the leading companies in the world to make an effort on the diversity side. And if you look at the payments it makes to its 50,000 employees, you'll see that it pays about $7 billion a year in, in wages and, and benefits and so on. But if you begin to look at the demographics around Intel's facilities, and analyze its employment relative to these demographics, you realize that it is missing representatives of minority communities all the way up its organization. And if you put the salaries to the, the numbers of people, and if you look at uh, equality of opportunity and equality of benefits, including gender 
equality, pay equality and so on and so forth, it reduces the positive employment impact of Intel from 7 billion to 2.5 billion. Now, should we not be sharing all of these figures, comparing them with the figures of the whole tech world and companies outside of tech and encouraging a race to the top? I think we have to share these figures because it is the way for us to cross the watershed from a paradigm that has served us well for 250 years, but that is no longer appropriate to the big challenges we face, to a new paradigm of risk, return and impact. We have to bring impact in this way to the center of our economic system alongside profit, to overthrow the tyranny of profit, if you like, and to put impact by its side to keep it in check. And if we do that, then we really do bring the invisible heart of markets to guide their invisible hand and build a better world. Uh, well, that's what the tutorial student has provided, Rick. So. You're, you're still muted. You're still muted, Rick. Thank you. If, if you responded as well at each tutorial as you've responded at this challenge, no wonder you were such an illustrious undergraduate. I, perhaps I could start off the, uh, the questions um, by asking you what impact, uh, with a small I, I guess, the pandemic has had on your thinking? Because clearly you've been working on these ideas for a long time and developing them, putting them into practice. Um, now the world's gone through this uh, acute, going through this acute crisis, the first one of our lifetimes of this sort. What reflections, how, how if at all, has it altered your approach to your subject? So I included the letter to the reader uh, about Corona. Uh, as you know, the book is being published uh, tomorrow and uh, you'll all be able to uh, read it. It basically says Corona is going to increase social pressures hugely. And if we seize the opportunity to introduce the new ways of thinking that are described in this book, we have a shot at turning this challenge into a real opportunity. But if we don't, the frustrations from increased inequality uh, will grow even more. Because, and now I leave the letter, uh, we're going to come out of this crisis, uh, Rick, with increased unemployment. I hear figures in the United States of up to 40% of those who have made, have been made unemployed, not being able to get their jobs back for one reason or another, with the one of the reasons being that big companies uh, have got used to operating on a slim down basis and they're going to try to stay uh, that way. It's going to create a need for reskilling people to get them back into employment. It's going to create a need to help the most vulnerable because once again the stimulus packages will go to buttress uh, the biggest uh, uh, employers uh, and the biggest uh, financial institutions and the most vulnerable uh, are going to get the least help. And so we're going to have very big uh, social backlash, in my view, if we don't do what our predecessors did in the 30s and say, look, there is a new New Deal. Now, because governments are going to be very heavily indebted and have more constrained budgets, the only way they can cope with this 
increase in, in social issues, social challenges, is by bringing impact investors to help in meeting these challenges, to get them to fund companies that put impact at to the core of their business models and begin to provide through our investments and through our companies solutions to the problems we face. So I think we're at a crossroads as we were in the 30s. In on one fork, we have the risk of great populism with all the terrible consequences that uh, populism has brought in the past. And in the other, we have the way of impact, of changing our capitalist system so that we continue to garner the advantages of capital and of markets, but we drive activity on the basis of both profit and impact. Corona, in that sense, will be an accelerator of uh, impact investment, at least in the countries which are receptive to it and don't go the populist uh, route. Thank you very much. If I can pick a, a question that's been submitted by your fellow Exodian Tom Brendan, his question is, how much have you related social impact to environmental impact? The two in my mind are very closely associated. The environmental movement started earlier, four or five decades ago. There's a lot of scientific analysis around it. Uh, there's a market for carbon credits. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, quantification in monetary terms of the damage uh, caused. Um, and that movement started top down, trying to influence governments um, to change regulation. The social impact movement started bottom up. We invented social impact bonds, development impact bonds, outcome funds to pay for the results achieved by these uh, uh, SIBs and DIBs as we call them, impact capital wholesalers like Big Society Capital, uh, which uh, use the 400 million pounds of unclaimed uh, uh, assets. Uh, and now impact weighted accounts. But the two should really be one movement. And two years ago at uh, the summit of the Global Steering Group, which I chair and which uh, includes now more than 32 countries, Al Gore came to speak. And he is, of course, one of the great leaders of the environmental impact movement. I think we can use the tools that we have invented in social impact for environmental impact. You can imagine huge outcomes funds to take plastic out of the sea or to reduce overfishing or reforestation or whatever. It's a pay for success mechanism uh, that enables us to attract um, uh, investment. And what I feel about impact weighted accounts is that for the first time we can monetize the social and the environmental impacts of a company and net them out. So I see them as one movement. And if Tom, you're involved with the environmental movement, we should join forces and do everything we can uh, to spread, you know, to spread uh, the word uh, that uh, I hope you'll feel the book carries. Well, thank you again for, for that answer, Ronnie. Um, question from Jeremy Wells. Social impact investment in aggregate is still niche across all asset classes, he says. How do you see impact becoming the mainstream in all asset classes? I, I see it becoming the mainstream by vaulting impact weighted accounts on companies so that the ESG $30 trillion, which today represents about one third of the world's professionally managed assets, have transparency about the impact that they're creating. If we bring impact measurement to investment, 
then we turn it into impact investment. And I see uh, today uh, impact investment approaches within public equities, uh, within the bond market, uh, within the private uh, uh, asset classes, private equity, uh, venture capital, property. You're right, uh, it, it is really moving to the mainstream now and it covers every uh, asset class. Thank you. Um, my colleague, uh, Colin McNichol, who's a fellow in Earth Sciences, his question is, when embarking on such an analysis, there are clearly short-term impacts and longer-term impacts. How should we measure those and tension them? And tension? Tension, yes. Right. Well, the issue of uh, short-termism in, in business won't be completely uh, solved by impact-weighted accounts, but I think impact-weighted accounts will contribute to solving it. For one thing, you can't measure um, impact every every three months terribly easily. Uh, and if you want to have an effect on uh, your employment uh, or your environmental emissions uh, and so on and so forth, um, it pushes you to longer term thinking. But I'm afraid shifting the world to long term thinking when public companies have to report their earnings on a quarterly basis is an uphill battle. Well, that seems an important point. Another uh, fellow Exonian, John Hall, says, he says, it seems to me that the funds available for social impact investment are minimized by the silos in private offices, for example, separating return generation and charitable giving. How can you break down those silos to release funds for impact investing? Hello, John. Great to have your question. And for those who don't know, John uh, worked for Goldman Sachs for many years and is a highly sophisticated uh, financial Exonian. Um, the answer, John, is that I believe that you can deliver better returns by optimizing risk return impact than by optimizing risk and return. And it's worth spending a few moments on this because if you think about it, the risk side when you take impact into account is reduced because you reduce the risk of consumers walking away from your product, of talent walking away from your company, uh, and investors are shifting away from investing in you. And you also reduce the risk of regulation and the risk uh, of taxation. But impact thinking also uncovers new sets of opportunities. And I want to give you an example, uh, John, if I may, uh, which is, I think, uh, illustrative uh, of how these opportunities appear when you put on uh, impact spectacles. Uh, there's a company here in Israel, I, I'm speaking to you from Tel Aviv, called Orcam. The entrepreneurs who set up Orcam are among the most successful in the world. Their field was is artificial intelligence and they sold the company after which they started, uh, uh, 17 years after starting it, for $15 billion to Intel. The aunt of one of the founders was going blind. She said to her nephew, you're a bright bloke, why don't you help me? Six years ago, he said, I think we can help the blind. And he created Orcam, which has invented a pair of spectacles that the blind or visually impaired can wear, which whispers into their ear the page of the book they're, they're reading or the page of the newspaper or the banknote in their hand. It can even recognize people if they have been stored before. It can even translate uh, uh, different languages. Now, there are 35 million blind people in the world. 
and 250 million visually impaired people. And so we would all say this is a spectacular, iconic impact venture. And indeed, it has been very successful. It raised $100 million and the last round uh, at which it raised money was a $600 million valuation. And we'd all say, clap. But if you put on impact spectacles, you ask yourself the question, how can my technology help the maximum number of people in the world? And you get a revealing answer, John. The answer is, what if we gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world? What would that do for their lives and their livelihood? What would it do for the economies of which they're a part? What would it do for the world economy to bring 800 million people from not reading to reading? And so I use it as an illustration that you uncover new markets. Now, if you say to me, OK, but uh, how can you uh, do something like that in the environmental area? Uh, I would point to Tesla. I think uh, Elon Musk is today probably the leading icon uh, in impact entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a company whose purpose is not just to make money, it's uh, to wean uh, our world away uh, from, uh, from uh, cars uh, which use a combustion engine. Uh, it's been hugely successful. It's worth more than General Motors. And so the way to break these silos down is to begin to explain in technical language for the investment community that the efficient investment frontier where you optimize risk and return is actually in a more attractive place when you add impact than when you don't have it. Now, what we're finding today, and it was more or less the same with technology, is some people accept these notions and are prepared to go for them. Many of them are young uh, people, uh, and others are, are reticent to accept them. And so within an investment organization like a, a family office or a charitable endowment like the Ford Foundation, you may have to appoint a different chief investment officer to look after, in the case of the Ford Foundation, the billion dollar ESG and impact investment portfolio they've set up. Because the existing uh, CIO uh, doesn't believe in it. So there are organizational challenges in, in uh, the way, uh, but uh, that's how I see we will break down the silos. If I could turn to a question from uh, Rosemary, who I think is my friend Rosemary Peacock, an important member of our senior common room. She wants to know how an individual who may not have all that much money to invest can play a significant role in the social impact movement. Well, uh, the social investment tax relief, which the government is proposing to scrap and so any of you who can write a letter to Jesse Norman, who is the minister in charge of this, uh, uh, of, of scrapping it uh, today, uh, he's open to being convinced, by the way, if there's sufficient support for keeping it going. Uh, the social investment tax relief, which I was involved in, in, in um, pushing, not to, totally in designing, because in the end, the design was uh, inhibited greatly by EU state aid regulation, gives every person that invests in helping a charitable organization uh, an offset against their income. So it saves them 30% tax, basically, at the time when they invest. So one of the things that you could do, Rosemary, is to invest in social impact bonds uh, which uh, today are helping uh, across the UK. There are about uh, 60 social impact bonds in, in the UK deal with 
a multitude of, of social issues, many of them around um, children, many of them around the elderly, around the homeless and, and so on. But you can also invest in different ways because Rosemary, you probably have a pension. And like every other person on this webinar that has a pension, I am sure you don't have the faintest idea of what your pension fund manager is doing with your money. And yesterday, a movement started in the UK called Make My Money Matter. There are $38 trillion, trillion dollars of pension fund assets in the world. I think in the UK, there are 14 million uh, uh, people with, uh, with uh, pensions. Uh, you'd think the number would be a lot bigger. So it, it may be that it is only a partial uh, uh, segment of, uh, of, of the whole pension uh, environment. Perhaps it's professionally managed uh, pensions. If you write to your pension manager after this webinar and say, I would like you to tell me how much you are investing uh, in environmental, social and governance investments and in impact investment and how you've arrived at the percentage that you're deploying, which you will find to be very low typically in the UK. Uh, that would be another way in which you could do it. I have a question from one of our current students, um, graduate student, who's also the treasurer of the middle common room, David Ritz, he wants to know where would the difference, where would be the difference between impact investment on the one hand and a higher taxation of profits made by current investment tools on the other? So we've discovered that if we tax, uh, we have declining revenues beyond a certain point. And the scale of the environmental issues we face today and the scale of the social issues cannot be solved by taxing more and redistributing in the case of social uh, issues. We have to bring the $200 trillion worth of investable assets in the world into play. And I agree that governments have to redistribute in order to reduce uh, social and economic uh, inequality. I agree that they have to provide incentives uh, for minorities to be properly represented. But it can't bring the solution by itself if our economic system is digging a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves as we get tax to try to fill it. Maria Hayden would like to know, do you anticipate that there will be a generational shift towards impact investing as Generation Y and Generation Z emerge? Totally. Uh, I think it, it started with the millennials and it's continuing with the young generations now. It is not solely uh, the province of younger people though. It's very interesting in Holland uh, the pension savers uh, for uh, the uh, for the health workers. Um, uh, let me rephrase it: uh, those pension savers who are contributing, uh, who are health workers, and contributing to a massive pension fund called PGGM, which is nearly 300 billion euros, um, have uh, succeeded in getting. Uh, their pension fund manager to make a $20 billion allocation. Uh, I don't know what the demographics are, what the age group is, but uh, if it's a pension fund which has been going on, which it has for many, many years, um, it, it'll have the demographics of the general population, so a very large number of, uh, of older people uh, too. So I think like the tech revolution, uh, it's uh, the young generation that is going to lead us there. Uh, but there'll be many of us uh, who are older, uh, like me, uh, helping along the way. Thank you. I have a question from Emma Bonder who wants to know, is it time now to measure prosperity rather than GDP and growth? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, the sort of thinking around impact weighted accounts will also give a big push uh, to the attempt to find a better measure of national prosperity than GDP. But I haven't tackled that issue yet. <laughs> you you uh, very interestingly outlined for us, Ronnie, in your presentation, the development of your own career choices. Um, and we have a question here, which I've temporarily lost in the Q&A column, but the, the, the gist of the question is, if someone listening to your talk is impressed by the importance of the arguments you're putting forward, how would you advise them to, in terms of their own occupational choice? So depending on what you intend to do, uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, then find a big problem to solve and build your business model to solve it and put measurable impact at the center of it. So define the metrics to measure it. If you want to work for a big company, then pick a company whose values are consonant with what I have described today. If you are self-employed, then apply uh, the values and the approaches that are you know, that I have described. Uh, the reason I wrote the book uh, is for the impact movement. It's not a book about me. Uh, to answer exactly that question, because what kind of world do we want to live in? And if it isn't exactly the world we're living in now, what role do we have to play in making the shift to the world we want? And the answer is every one of us on this webinar and outside it has a role to play. As a consumer buying product, as a person uh, finding um, uh, employment and, and so on, as I described, as I described before. So if after if after this webinar, uh, you're inclined to think differently about your venture or your employment or your investments, uh, then put that into practice. Well, thank you. We're, we're coming right up to the, the hour that we engaged you for. So I, I think we ought to give you a bit of a respite, but um, I've, I've only been able to put to you about a quarter of the questions which have been submitted. But um, I apologize to those many questioners with many who put forward many excellent questions that we haven't been able to cover. But uh, rest assured, we will submit them to uh, Ronnie so that he uh, knows about them. And uh, with his typical uh, industriousness, you'll probably get an answer, I would think, before, before too long. But Ronnie, I think it's a, a great tribute um, to this presentation and to your expertise on the subject and um, if I may say so, the um, uh, qualities of mind that we hope Exeter College enhanced or at least didn't inhibit from developing that you've been able to answer so interestingly such a wide variety of questions. I think we, we've all been to talks of various kinds where the questioner um, uh, the, the person giving the presentation uh, speaks so long and so obliquely to questions that only two or three questions are ever reached. And um, you've been wonderfully concise, uh, terrifically analytical and very much to the point, which I think has really reinforced and helped to fill out the important message that uh, you've given us. So I'm sure I speak not just for all the questioners, but for all the people who have been tuned in to this inaugural uh, Exeter College Alumni and Friends webinar um, in wishing to thank you very much indeed uh, for your presentation and your answers to questions um, and to wish you very well um, in the publication of your book Impact when it comes out later this week. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all. Exeter has a very special place in uh, in my heart and it's wonderful to have uh, shared this occasion with you. We're very grateful. Thank you.
Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye. all. Thank you all for attending and tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.